What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Mass Effect 1, specifically the Legendary Edition. And as I had told people in my impressions video, I have never actually played the Mass Effect series before, despite playing almost all of Bioware's other games. I will be reviewing the other two, however we're going to be taking a break in between each of them. And to get my usual stuff out of the way here, I review games after 100% all the time, it's a regular occurrence. It's something I do to set me apart from other reviewers and YouTubers on the platform. And for this review in particular, I'm definitely going to be talking a bit about spoilers, you know, the game's 15 years old. I think I think most people are well aware of the story of this, but if you are watching this specifically because you haven't played the title, I am going to be spoiling it a little bit. Broadly speaking, Mass Effect 1 is of course a space RPG, however I would say that at least this first game is a bit light on the RPG mechanics. So I am going to make some criticisms about this game, especially later on, however, I am fully aware that this is a series and these things are likely to improve. So specifically about the first game, it's a bit light on the RPG mechanics. But first up, let's talk a tiny bit about the story. So the setup, of course, is that we play as Commander Shepard. We are investigating a disturbance on a planet known as Eden Prime. That then leads to the broader narrative of a Spectre, which is a sort of galactic special forces unit, going rogue. His name is Saren. We learn of this, come in contact with an ancient beacon that gives us visions we don't understand about the impending doom on the universe. All of this while we learn all about the humans interacting with the galactic community for the first time, all the different alien species, the politics involved therein, all the advances in technology known as the Mass Effect, which is things like relays, etc. that allow sort of instantaneous space travel, or at least very, very quickly that doesn't take more than your lifespan. Which brings me to my first major point about the story, is that I think it is a fantastic way to introduce people to the game. I especially love the introduction and the early parts of the game where you're confined to the Citadel. They do a fantastic job of setting up the universe itself, all the different alien species, the political motivations behind different factions, humans and their place in that community. They even integrated the companions very well into it. I loved the way the introduction was written. Another note on the story is Saren, the villain. I think he is a great villain, actually. And you don't really interact with him that much, which is the interesting part. You only really have like one or two conversations with the guy. However, in that short span, they manage to set up the mystery about what he's doing and why. Then later they get to explain his exact motivations. And all of that culminates in a fantastic boss fight that was very cool albeit definitely cheesy, but nonetheless a cool boss fight, especially if you have the skills to persuade him. I was really feeling it by the end of the story, I guess, is my point. I will say that a lot of the writing around the story, you can definitely tell it's a 15-year-old game as the original game released in 2007. So I will say that parts of it, not so much the quality of it, but how it is written, the style and the tone, you can definitely tell it's an older title in that way. And there are points where they're definitely kind of pigeonholing you down a path, despite it presenting itself as an RPG, they're again a bit light on the mechanics here, so they just kind of railroad you down one particular path regardless of what you say or what you do. Now from there let's talk a bit about character creation. So first of all, how character creation is presented is you sort of like restoring the military record that you have. A tiny detail, but I just love things like that where they kind of add a sort of like in-universe explanation for the character creation. When it's done well, I think it's enjoyable even if it is a little silly. Now for character creation, we can of course choose to play as either a male or female Commander Shepard. I would tell you having messed around with both of them, I didn't notice a ton of details outside of like who was romanceable, that type of stuff. So from there we can pick a background, which is sort of how Commander Shepard joined the military, and then we can pick a sort of experience that they had in the military as well. Now, for the most part, in terms of what this translates to in-game, it's pretty much just extra dialogue as well as the, I believe it's background giving you one quest per, which can add a little bit to the feel and kind of give you more of a familiarity with your character, or at least the character of Commander Shepard. So it's not much in terms of creating a character, but it's more than nothing. Now, then we can pick our class. I would tell you it will change how you play, like different classes are good at different things. They get different skills, different bonuses to types of 
of weapons, so it's not exactly useless. However, I would say that the combat in this game is probably the most lackluster part of the title, and we'll talk more about that in the combat section. But generally speaking, after having messed around with all of these a little bit, just kind of get the flavor of them, if you will, the general gist is always the same, but the exact skills and stuff will change and, you know, the exact weapon you're using, but there's only like a handful of different weapon types to begin with. So kind of like the background, etc., there is more to the classes than nothing. But in this particular game, I didn't find this choice wildly differentiating a lot of it. Now, I've heard that the combat greatly improves past this first game. So hopefully this is something I'll see iterated on. As a result of the combat not being great, I found the classes never really got a chance to shine. Now that said, you will eventually get a specialization class on the completion of a specific side quest, which will then help you differentiate your class a little farther. In my particular case, I was playing a Vanguard for my primary run through, mostly because I thought it was the most interesting sounding class. And one of the specializations actually helped me decrease a bunch of cooldowns, which then let me use my skills more often. And that was probably the most substantial change that I felt specifically from using a class. So once we get all that sorted out and we play the game, character progression comes down to a few different things. So for starters, the legendary edition brought with it a different scaling method. So it kind of crunched it all down into one playthrough of levels one through 30, as opposed to the previous levels one through 60. And because of this scaling, it affects a few different things as a result. For instance, for difficulty, I jumped straight into Insanity, which is the highest difficulty, which in my opinion was honestly pretty easy. I was expecting it to be much worse than it turned out to be. And the general consensus around this seems to be that the difficulty in general with the Legendary Edition scaling is that it is much reduced. And I think this was to alleviate some of the pain points of the combat not being great. But then we have our equipment and skills. Equipment is tiered, so depending on your character's level, you can find equipment up to a certain tier of one through 10. 10, of course, being the best stuff. And then we have our skills. As we level up, we'll get skill points to then put in our skills, which will make us more effective in general. Now, from there, let's talk about the world building and the gameplay. So at the beginning of the game, you're kind of stuck in a very linear sequence. The prologue sees us taking on a mission to be evaluated for entrance into the specters in order to be the first human specter. That mission, of course, went sideways, as we already talked about, which sees us back on the Citadel, where we need to then prove that something is going on with Saren, which we can't really go anywhere else and do anything else until we do. So we run around the Citadel doing side quests, etc. And once we finish up that portion of the game, we are officially announced as the first human specter, given our own ship, the Normandy, and set off out into the world to chase down Saren primarily. Now at this point, we are free to tackle the game pretty much however you want. You'll be able to travel to different solar systems, survey planets for materials and gear, which really just involves clicking on the planet and then clicking the survey button. And if you're paying attention, you might notice asteroid belts in some of these systems. If you scan around that asteroid belt, sometimes you can find hidden asteroids and stuff that you can also survey just as a little extra. But this is where I want to talk about the side content of this game. And quite frankly, it's really bad. So outside of doing the world map stuff where you go to the world map inside the Normandy, click on it and take a look at it, which is what brings up this menu and all these planets, etc. But as we enter these systems for the first time on the Normandy, and sometimes when we just find them organically while we're exploring the few planets we can land on, we'll run into side quests. Now, a few of these are actually interesting, but most of the side content is very bad. It is genuinely go here, kill a couple enemies in a building that is almost identical to every other building of the same type. They just change around a few things scenery wise, but the layout's the same. It's like one or two rooms. You go in, kill a couple enemies, interact with something, quest over. In addition to that, in order to land on those planets that you can land on, you're usually dropped in on the Mako. The Mako has apparently had its controls improved since the first title. Like the scaling, you can't actually change this between the legacy controls and the original. I would tell you both are terrible. <laughs> Even the improved version was not really a good time. I will say you do kind of get used to it after a few hours, but even then, driving the Mako always feels like 
a bit of a mess. More than that, the planets they drop you down on have almost nothing. Like, it's a pretty big area they let you explore in the Mako, but unfortunately, there's just not a lot of stuff there. There is occasionally things you can hop out of the Mako, because when you land on a planet, you're in a spacesuit, technically, so you can't just get out of the Mako on foot and kind of explore and interact with things. So it's not that there's nothing on these planets, it's just that there's so much space with so much distance in between all this stuff, and some of these planets feel like they're deliberately designed to be almost impossible to navigate, even in the Mako, and it can get very frustrating very, very quickly. And as someone who went through and did every one of these side quests, saw every one of these planets, I would tell you that a lot of this could have been cut from the game without it being any worse for wear, frankly. However, luckily, what I think saves the side content from dragging the rest of this game down is that the universe and the world you are exploring, the actual world building part of it, is incredibly interesting. Like, every one of these alien races is really unique and has their own thing going on, their own physiologies, their own cultures, traditions, all this stuff, and it's just just really interesting because all of them are so different. All of the politics surrounding all of this and the technology they're using is also very interesting, which I think is what saves the side content from being pretty god-awful, honestly. Now, before we move on to combat, I would be remiss if I did not mention the Paragon and Renegade system. And at least for this first game, it seems to primarily just affect Shepard's behavior. For instance, are you being nice or are you being an asshole? But basically, in conversation, you can be nice or rude, and you'll get the associated Paragon or Renegade points. The higher this meter in the first game, the more you can increase its associated skill when you level up, charm, or intimidate. This will allow you to pass the various morality checks throughout the game. Now, while there are differences between these things, including things like avoiding fights versus taking part in them, which will then lead to the results of that quest changing slightly, like is someone dead or did you talk them down, that type of stuff. At least in this first game, the differences are relatively minor, and things for the most part play out the same way. Now, it's my understanding that this changes a bit in the later games and that it's more impactful, but I would tell you after doing a playthrough of each for the first game, I did not notice a significant difference between the two outside of literally how my character is behaving, but the results of that behavior were not as pronounced as I was expecting, I guess you could say. Because for the most part, it just changed the dialogue as opposed to substantial changes to the way the game played out. Now, there were changes to be clear. For instance, the ending changes a little bit depending on which one you have more of, that type of stuff. But at least for this first game, it did not affect as much as I was expecting it to. But from here, let's talk combat. Combat comes down to, I would say, two modes when you're either in the Mako or when you're running around on foot. Now, in the Mako, you can get a lot of easy XP by just murdering stuff in the Mako. You get a turret on the Mako and a sort of explosion or rocket blast that you can set off by using the left and right mouse buttons respectively. And a good way to like level up right when you finally start exploring the universe is to just go land on planets with like enemies and stuff and just kill them in the Mako. You'll get a ton of experience very quickly for very little effort, which can kind of get you going pretty quick, especially on higher difficulties. And some parts of the game do have mandatory sections where you're driving the Mako down like corridors and stuff. So so expect to need to get used to this. The rest of it, outside of the Mako being a terrible way to drive, on foot, we run into other problems. The combat itself is largely a cover shooter system. So for starters, the cover system activates by you just kind of walking up to a ledge. Your character will just automatically jump into cover. However, this does not work very well, and oftentimes when you're just trying to run to a location or you just happen to step too close to a wall on accident, your character jumps into cover when you're not trying to make them do that, which can cause you a lot of headaches. I also ran into uh, bugs pretty regularly here. Everything from if I was in combat for a little too long, the audio would just completely cut out. A couple times my companions or an enemy would just become immortal and I would just have to die or reload one. Other times enemies would just randomly die with no one hitting them. And overall, it wasn't irredeemable, but uh, again, the combat in this game is just not a good experience overall. Again, I've heard the combat improves with the other two entries in the series, but even with the improvements that were made to the Legendary Edition, it's not great. I would tell you by the end, though, once you kind of get the hang of the quirks and the little things that this title likes to do, it can still be fun. Like, by the end of it, which is kind of a big combat slog, I was using abilities, having a lot of fun, with just the occasional annoyance. Now, for 
me, I used a Vanguard primarily, and they get a biotic skill, which is sort of like psychic energy that they can use, that allowed me to just like lift an enemy up and stun them. And I found this particular ability to be just an instant win for most combat situations, as you can do this to most things, including boss fights which means I effectively completely stun an enemy for several seconds, and with geared up characters, they would get lifted up and just annihilated. And combine that with my specialist class, where I reduced the cooldown of lift, I was using it very regularly, which made a lot of the tougher enemies in the late game that are just bullet sponges kind of whatever. Now that said, in addition to the variety of skills you get, because you know there are several other classes with different skills, you get sorts of tech skills, support skills that'll heal your characters. Combine that with the limited controls you have over your companion's AI, because you can take part in combat with a party of up to three, you and two companions. And there is a little bit to the combat, and I want to stress that it can be enjoyable. There's just a lot of problems with it that really drag the experience down unnecessarily. But that combined with the weapon variety, etc., like sniper rifles, pistols, assault rifles, kind of like the standard stuff, a lot of those weapons within those classes also behave a little differently as well. And because of that, combat can feel pretty good if you get past the negative stuff. Now, let's talk about companions. These were mostly great. There are six of them in total, and we're going to start with the one I didn't like at all, and that was Caden, and that is because this guy has the personality of a wet blanket. So he is a biotic, an individual with what appears to be psychic capabilities, more or less, that have been the subject of experiments and questionable ethics that have left them with powers, and sometimes this scars these people pretty deeply. Well, in Caden's case, he uses an older sort of an implant that was given to him for this purpose, which causes him a couple of health problems, but beyond that, he has got nothing going on. His dialogue's boring. He's just a boring character. In fact, there is a moment in the story where you have to choose between sacrificing him and another character. And I would be surprised if almost everyone didn't sacrifice Caden because it's like, who cares about this guy? Now, his counterpart, Ashley, which also joins you at the start of the game, is a terrible person, I would say, but she's interesting, if nothing else, in comparison to Caden. So Ashley is a bit of a space racist and also the descendant of a failed military general who led pretty much the only loss humans have seen in the galactic community when they first made contact with aliens. So she's got this huge chip on her shoulder in addition to just not trusting aliens to the point of it being a sort of racism that she then tries to back up by saying it's not racism. But so I wouldn't say Ashley is a good person or even a good companion, but she is nonetheless a character with a story, whereas Caden just has nothing going on. Then we have Garrus. Garrus was a favorite of mine. He is a Turian, one of the races of Alien. He's a sort of like a grizzled space cop who is frustrated with how CSEC, the uh, Citadel space cops, handle things. So he wants to like do things outside the protocol, that type of stuff, which is why he joined your party. You kind of help him investigate something on the Citadel. And overall, I kind of loved this vibe because the grizzled cop is like also an alien, which makes it more interesting. And getting closer to him kind of involves talking about his previous work with CSEC. And I thought that was just overall a really cool vibe. Then we have Rex. I think Rex is honestly one of the best companions because there's so much more to him than you would initially think. So Rex is a Krogan, which are sort of these brutes. Kind of everything about them is huge and lumbering. They're known for being kind of hot-tempered, doing a lot of mercenary work, that type of stuff. But if you actually talk to Rex, he has like a surprisingly deep story. So he's going to tell you all about the genophage, which is a disease more or less that was given to the Krogan to slow their growth after their population basically exploded and you can have conversations with him where he's disappointed that his race is doing nothing to solve this problem basically because they're all so concerned with fighting each other rather than solving it and while he himself is a Krogan through and through he can think farther beyond just fighting things and as a character I just thought he was really interesting in that regard he has so much to tell you and teach you about Krogans and it's a race that in my opinion seems very surface level when you first encounter them but there's so much more there and because of the genophage they are appropriately rare so it's usually kind of a big moment when you meet them. 
Then we have Tali. Now, I think Tali overall is a member of the most interesting race, the Quarians. They are the creators of the Geth, which is a race that comes up, a sort of machine race that comes up a lot throughout the story as they are serving one of the main antagonists. And overall, I found the Quarians' culture very interesting. They ultimately wound up losing their home to the Geth, so now they all kind of live on this migrant fleet of spaceships, which has left their immune systems in a pretty rough shape, so they have to wear these like specialized spacesuits so they don't really ever see physical contact with anything. And overall, I just found them as a race to be the most interesting. And it helps that Tali is a pretty great character as well. She'll teach you a ton about the Quarians, and there's a lot there to enjoy. And then we have the last one, Liara. She is a member of what is kind of, I would say, one of the most influential races, the Asari. However, her character is kind of boring. Like a lot of the other alien races, she can tell you kind of all about this main race. However, she as a character is kind of just awkward and she's supposed to have spent most of her life as a researcher. She doesn't know that much about like humans and other alien culture, so she just comes across as weird. Which, to be fair, I suppose is the point. But for me personally, it kind of made it hard to connect with her because it's just like, <sighs> you make the conversation very strange. But as I mentioned, she can tell you all about the Asari, which are another very unique and interesting race, which this universe managed to be chock full of, which I think is probably my main takeaway from the companion is that they did such a fantastic job crafting the alien races and the alien companions as a result are so much more interesting because of that. And I found the human companions so boring because it's just like the most standard stuff that you see everywhere. And it's like, do I really want to hear about Ashley's problems with her grandfather or do I want to hear about Garrus's ex-space cop adventures? It's a pretty easy choice for me. But overall, the companions were mostly great. I enjoyed them a lot. I've heard that the next game, Mass Effect 2, does way better with the companions companions, so I'm excited to see how that develops and evolves as well, which is probably a good place to hit you guys with positives, negatives, and wrap this thing up. So, positives. The story, the main story especially, is fantastic. I didn't talk about it too much in depth, but the stuff with the Reapers and just kind of the setup, you can kind of see where this is going at the end of it, I would say, is really cool. There's a lot to it. I think it's really well paced. The writing is solid, if a tiny bit dated, and I had a lot of fun with the main story. The other positives were the universe itself, I think, is really well fleshed out. There's a ton of lore there to learn. You can look up the codex to get even more of it. For content, context, dates, etc. And you can tell they put a ton of care into crafting this universe for you to explore. Now, on the flip side of that, the negatives, the universe itself is not fun to explore, literally, as things like the Mako controls, the combat just being bad in a lot of ways make it tough to enjoy those parts of the game. However, if you were to just sprint through the main story, I think it's a very enjoyable experience even to this day, albeit a bit clunky with the combat. But then one thing I haven't really mentioned up to this point, I kind of alluded to it by saying that it was light on the RPG mechanics. While I have praised this game a lot, I would scarcely call this game an RPG in a lot of ways. This almost feels more like a regular old third-person shooter. The RPG mechanics are very lacking. This specific game has almost no choices, very few of which affect the story of it in any way, which I understand obviously those choices will affect the later titles, but this title as a standalone game has almost no choices. The combat is definitely more action focused than it is RPG focused. So overall, my conclusion for this title is that it's a fantastic story if a little light on the RPG parts. I'm definitely looking forward to playing it because it was a lot of fun. I would say, again, conclusion wise, I'd probably just play it for the main story and the companions, I don't think I would mess around with the side content too much outside of just doing a review very specifically like this. Most of it is not really noteworthy. And while the game is certainly very janky in places, you know, it's an older title, so obviously some of it was going to be, I think the story more than anything holds up pretty well. I think it's a pretty awesome story, actually. So looking forward to playing the next two. But for now, I certainly hope you guys enjoyed this review of the first game. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Let me know all about it down below. That said, keep in mind I haven't played the next one, so avoid spoilers in the comments for my sake. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you for watching. Again, may you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.